views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome everyone, I'm your host, Ivy Moomin. We are joined in the studio today by members from two organizations with programs that help individuals who have had run-ins with the law but are now looking to turn their life around. Our first guest is from an organization which works with our youth in providing them with the support, education, and necessary tools to successfully return to their community and break the cycle of delinquency. Please welcome the director of the Juvenile Justice Program at Leak and Watts, Lisa Crook. Our second guest has over 15 years experience providing individuals with past criminal justice involvement with the resources they need to get their life back on the right track. Please welcome the Director of Workforce Development at the Osborne Association, Andre Ward. Thank you both for being here. I know you have incredibly busy schedules and the work you're doing is so important, so I appreciate the fact that you come to spend time with us. So what I'd love to do first is hear about your organizations and have you also talk about what you do there. So, Lisa, can we start with you? Sure. So I work for Leak and Watts Services. Um, we operate, we've been in the Bronx since the 1940s. Um, mm. We have family foster care, we have a elementary school, we have Head Start programs and child care, uh, we have preventive programs. And I operate um, our non-secure and limited secure programs in the Bronx. We have one for girls and one for boys. Um, we also have programming in Brooklyn, um, juvenile justice programming in Brooklyn, as well as secure detention for Westchester County in Valhalla. Um, and we have a large campus in Yonkers, just on the Riverdale border. So we are all over. Yeah, you're big. Yeah. How big is the organization? Yeah, so we have uh, 1,200 employees. So we have programs for adults with developmental disabilities yeah. as well. We have several of those in the Bronx. So um, we serve about 8,000 kids and families um, and adults a year. And in the Bronx, it's about 5,000 people that we serve yeah, um, annually. Yeah. And how did you get there? And what are you doing there? So I'm actually originally from Kansas. <laughs> okay, I became a social worker and um, found a passion for juvenile justice. I've had a passion since um, since I was young in juvenile justice. And um, I went to graduate school here in New York and I fell in love. I worked for the Department of Juvenile Justice um, mm. as an intern when I was doing graduate school. And New York City is the place to be. And I um, have stayed ever since. I didn't look back. Good for yeah, you, yeah. that's great. Mm -hmm. And Andre, how about you? What does Osborne do and what are you doing there? <laughs> So the Osborne Association has, you know, it's a reentry organization that's been around for over 80 years, um, offering services to families and individuals who've had ju criminal justice involvement, uh, specifically in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, and in Newburgh. Um, we've been around for 80 years offering this service provision. We are all too familiar with the body of work around criminal justice policy and reform and service provision. Um, I think central to our work is family, and how we engage the individual and their families. Um, so we look at adopting healthy lifestyles as one part of, of our you know, engagement with families and individuals. And so we have our wellness and prevention services. So we work with people who may be diagnosed with HIV or AIDS and have other kind of chronic illnesses. We work with them and support them in that way. Um, we believe in strengthening um, relationships right, with our community. So strengthening communities is important to us and we engage the community in different ways to build them up. Um, we really look at the idea of reconnecting families because we understand that the mm -hmm. individual is a part of a larger kind of reality wherein they are part of a family matrix and in that family there has to be this healing and this kind of support and growth. Um, we believe in fostering economic independence, right? And we want people to grow in an independent way economically so they can become sustainable and self-sufficient. So adopting this as a part of their lifestyle is important to us. And then, you know, we look at reducing reliance on incarceration as a part of our focus. So we have policy work that we're developing, and we have a center that we have recently begun to um, look at and to develop and grow 
And, you know, the work that we do features and centers around all of those things. I've been at the Osborne Association for five years. Um, mm -hmm. I started off, I was telling my colleague and friend here, I started off as an outreach worker and have been promoted several times, and now I'm the director of the entire department. And so, you know, the Osborne Association works with individuals through the entire incarcerated continuum. So it starts from arrest to pre-entry to re-entry. And so we look at all of those things as important and central to our work. Did you two know each other before you came no, into this world? No. Really? And I'm yeah. actually a social worker by profession. So oh, I so. I earned my graduate degree here at Lehman. Because it, it, it seems very much like you would be, at, yeah. at some point, paths mm -hmm. would cross. But I, I know people doing this kind of work have a tendency to be working in the silo where they work because their work is so, is mm -hmm. so big that yeah. it's very hard to. It's, we often think about bringing people together for some sort of conference around. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get people. I, I have emails all the time from people saying, something just happened and I can't get there and I so wanted to be there. And, because I think it's I mean, our work is, I mean, as she was saying before about the people that they serve, I mean, we serve 10,000 people annually. We're in um, nine city jails and 22 state facilities, right? So this body of work, no one has a monopoly mm -hmm. on it. Yep. It's a vast feel, mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, and precisely the reason why we're engaged in this work is because everyone needs to be engaged mm -hmm. in some way. Um, to work with the populations we serve. Right. So you specifically work with young people. Yes. Yeah. But mm -hmm. so how old? So in the state of New York, the age of criminal responsibility mm -hmm. is 16. So mm -hmm. we work with kids who, in, in my programs, um, have al been alleged to have committed or have committed a crime before the age of 16. And mm -hmm. you are, are you working with young people as yeah, well? Yeah, so we do work with our younger people. Um, through our Children, Youth, and Family Services Department. We work with younger people and their families. We have our court advocacy services that a lot of younger people come through um, to serve as a deterrent from going to incarceration. They may come through our programs. In the department that I'm responsible for, workforce development, as I was sharing with my colleague earlier, we have two programs that we work with younger people. One is our Justice Community Program, which is a city-funded program. Um, working with the Department of Probation. And so there are 18 to 24 year old young adults who've had some justice involvement. So whether it was um, an arrest for jumping a turnstile mm -hmm. or something a bit more serious, um, we welcome them into our job readiness training career exploration program called Justice Community. Then we have our Next Step Arches program, which we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, which is an extension of the Young Males Initiative um, under Mayor Bloomberg, and so now under Mayor de Blasio, it's called Next Step Arches, that features working with younger people from 16 to 24 in the capacity of offering mentoring and interactive journaling and trips mm -hmm. that would expose them to a different kind of reality um, from which they came. And so that's critically important to our work. Um, we have a shared clinical philosophy as an organization and a lot of our work is driven by a trauma-informed care approach. Yeah. Because our younger people, and by extension their families, have experienced trauma in their lives. So our shared clinical philosophy, working with our um, trauma-informed care approach, really helps to empower the people that we work with, specifically our younger people. We're taking a short break, but we'll return with more Mission Bronx right after this. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes, B, console her, Don't worry, sweetie. This is going to happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice, single boys. <laughs> that was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Todd's a great guy. I mean, look at him. What a sweetheart. boy. Wait, Todd, what are you doing? How totally selfish and untodd-like of you. Come on, Todd. Come on, man. As an American, it's hard to hear that we have a serious hunger issue in our country. And as a parent, it's even harder to hear that one in five of our kids struggles with hunger. 
especially when billions of pounds of good food are wasted every year. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide billions of meals to families in need right in your community. Visit feedingamerica.org to support Feeding America and your local food bank. Together we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Eileen Newman, and I'm here with Lisa Crooks, director of the juvenile justice programs at Lincoln Watts, as well as Andre Ward, director of workforce development at the Osborne Association. We're going to take a little um, moment here to also show a video, a short video, about Lincoln Watts and some of the work we're doing there. I'm not proud to say I'm here. I'm not glad to be here at all, but I'm kind of happy I did come here. I got charged with grand larceny in the third degree and um, possession, stolen jewelry. It was a dumb decision, it wasn't worth it. Now, nah, like, I know that there's other opportunities out there than stealing. The NSP program is more or less of a second chance program, so they won't go back out there and commit crimes and go back into the negative behavior that they've been into. Um, a lot of them come in, they come in with a little chip on their shoulder, anger problems. We get them to participate in group, to uh, learn how to communicate, because a lot of them have issues doing that. So we give them an alternative route to how to express yourself without acting out. I never had like a male figure to go to. So I think like some of the staff that I'm connected to, I could talk to, whatever. And they like give me advice and I really use it. Whatever I want to do, if I really focus on it, I could do it. For instance, like when I started school, I was behind a lot, a lot. Now I'm in the head of the class. You know, Lisa, one of the things that, that strikes me when I look at this, and it, it strikes me a lot when I look at the news, is that this is a kid. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a young person. Mm -hmm. This is, um, you know, this isn't a hardened, the, the quote, hardened criminal right. who's been arrested multiple times. And yeah. so, so what, if, and I guess this question is for both of you, but I'll start with you. If you look at the system, and you've been now working in it for a while, and you've been working in it for a while, mm -hmm. What are you seeing in terms of changes, in terms of things getting better or things getting worse? Or Yeah, I, I actually, since I've been in New York, I, I think it's been an incredible sort of progression of really thoughtful policy changes that are looking at using data and supporting moving, um, in the juvenile justice system specifically, moving kids out of physical placement, keeping them in the communities, um, really focusing on education and making sure that we're delivering supports and services to kids, right? Everybody knows that locking up kids and adults doesn't sure. work. Sure. And, yeah. and now, um, through some of our programs, like the Close to Home programs, we're able to use therapeutic supports and services. You talk about trauma-informed care. We really use that lens in all of the work that we do with the kids, and we're able to really be thoughtful and, and talk to them. like you're not your last worst action, right? This, this doesn't have to be who you are. This doesn't define you. This is a moment in your life, and let's use it as an opportunity, and, and the staff are there to support them. And, you know, I get really, I see Brandon in that video, and I see our staff, Foster, and, and I just, um, you know, these are moments where these kids historically would have been upstate in facilities that are like prisons. This is a home-like setting where kids can actually connect with staff who invest in them. And, you know, they come back to us and say, hey, I'm doing great. Um, you know, I ran into a kid the other day by one of our programs. He saw a sign, a um, program we just opened on Ryer Avenue, and he's like, Leek and Watts, and I walked out, and he ran up and gave me a huge hug. Oh, nice. And he's like, I haven't been in trouble. I'm doing well. No. It's, you know, it's, sure. it's a beautiful thing to see that. So could you describe the Close to Home uh, process program and how that actually does work? Yeah, so um, before Close to Home happened, New York City kids, if they had been adjudicated um, of having committed a delinquent act, um, 
uh, would go upstate to facilities operated by the state. Um, they would be far away from their homes, far away from their families, yeah. uh, not in New York City schools, mm -hmm. and so they would be coming home after having been there. And they, they may have been going to school when they were in that, in that program, but New York City principals got to decide whether or not they got credit. So kids were coming back having oh, not earned school credit, um, and a lot of our kids are behind in school already. Right. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, they were, it was wasted time. They, uh, their families couldn't travel all those distances to see them. So New York City and New York State were able to create this great initiative where kids are able to be in or really close to New York City and um, remain in New York City schools. So we go to school with our kids in one of our programs. They're on site. New York City Department of oh. Education is on site with us, working hand in hand um, with the kids. They're able to, we have an eighth grader right now who mm -hmm. is earning ninth grade credit um, oh, and is feeling really proud of herself. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have another young man in our non-secure program in the Bronx who was like, I didn't go to school for two years. Now I get up and go every day and he's feeling really great and proud of himself. So they're able to stay in facilities closer to their houses, um, to their communities that are more home-like and therapeutic. So that's basically the close to home. You know, there's a, uh, there's a book that I um, read called Random Families. It's about, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's about families in the Bronx who have, um, who have been hit by everything with drugs, illness, po poverty, starting in poverty, and all of the things that, that have a tendency to grow out of that. And one of the things that happens to this extended family is that someone becomes incarcerated. And it's the same thing. They can't, mm -hmm. they're poor. They can't afford to see this person. Mm -hmm. It's the father of a couple of children. And you watch the whole family deteriorate mm -hmm. because they can't stay connected. And then the mother of the children is trying to just put food on the table. So yeah. so could you talk a little bit about what you what you spoke briefly about, about in terms of working with the families and the kind of work you do with yeah, the Yeah, Eileen, you know, it's really interesting. The Bronx, and when you look at many of the social indicators, has some of the highest rates of, of asthma, unemployment. I mean, yeah. certainly um, it's becoming more progressive and moving further away from that in many instances. But because of those kind of conditions, um, obviously, the people in those communities that are affected by that um, may come in contact with and have come in contact with the criminal justice system. And so with the Osborne Association and us working with the families and the people who have been impacted by the justice system, you know, we look at it from a holistic perspective. Our goal is to empower the individual. If we work with them to transform their life, um, we maintain that by extension they can transform their families and communities' lives. And, and or the people that's in their community's lives. And that's important for us. Um, so we have these different interventions and in workforce development, our goal is to be consistent with the career pathways model or report that's been put out by, the, by Mayor uh, de Blasio around these bridges, right? Creating these opportunities for participants, um, individuals to get into an educational track um, where there is a credential that can be earned during that time and obviously it can lead to some career um, path that has a ladder to it. I'm gonna have to stop you. Sure. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back with more Mission Bronx after the break. Hey Gabby, how you doing? How was the play date and sleepover? Dad, it was great. Awesome, okay, I'm on my way. Hey guys, what are you doing? We're going swimming! We're going back yeah! I'll see you in a little bit, guys. I love you. Hi, babe. How was school today? Hi, Dad. It was great. Okay, honey. I'll be home soon. Remember, you're never too far away from your kids to be a dad. Reach out and take a second to check in, because sometimes the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. This is the story of a boy who was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. It made him feel uncomfortable. One day, he found out he had something called autism. His family got him help, and slowly, he learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. 
But did you know Terry cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. Totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you guys know statistically friendly kids have more friends? Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. Welcome back. I'm your host, Eileen Newman, and we've been talking in the studio with two members from two organizations working to better the lives of individuals who have been formally involved with the criminal justice system. So both of you have started out as social workers or have a social worker background. Mm -hmm. So you must have had a sense of what that was going to be. Did you choose to work in this environment when you were thinking about social work or did you have just the general, I'll find a job as a social worker and I'm not sure what sector it would be? Well, for me, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York and, and raised there all my life and so had first-hand experiences with understanding the community, um, some of the very things that we saw um, growing up and what I see now are very much similar. Um, there is sometimes despair, um, there's a lack of hope, um, there is scarcity of resources or scarcity of resources. And because of those things, you know, people make these decisions, right, to go into a way of living that's obviously against the law. I'm not at all unfamiliar with that. I served 16 years in prison. And I was released in January 16th of 2009. And I came home from prison not having a degree at all. A week after I was released from prison, I enrolled in college full time. I went on to earn my associates, my bachelor's in, un in social work, um, and uh, went on to earn my undergraduate degree. And so I became a huge kind of part of this work of criminal justice reform. So this work is not just a profession necessarily to me, it's also a life's work, right? And it's a part of this idea of redeeming myself through empowering others. So there's this civic kind of duty that I have to the communities that I contributed to its deterioration. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, um, really getting people to understand what criminal justice policy reform is and some of the recommendations coming from those who have been impacted by the justice mm -hmm. system are. And so I'm not the only one. I mean, there are many, many of us that are out there doing this work. The Osborne Association that has over 200 and 10 or so people that are employed in our various sites in Bronx, Brooklyn, and Newburgh, um, we have maybe 30 to 40 percent of the people working there that have had justice involvement. And so it gives us a different understanding and approach to the experience because we have this kind of first-hand kind of knowledge. And so those who may not have that experience necessarily but are passionate obviously can do just as much effective work. But that's what really drives me. And this is why I'm committed to this work, because I'm a part of the experience. It's very personal. Mm -hmm. it's very, very personal, yeah. sure, sure. Thank you for telling yeah, us that. It's fine, it's fine. I, re I remember that Our you did tell me that, and I thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> really No, and did. it's interesting that I've had you know, some really great um, role models for me. Our CEO and President Elizabeth Gaines has certainly looked to many of us um, to support the work that she has done with with the Osborne Association. But I mean, many of us who've had just an involvement, we see ourselves as really change agents in this work and thought leaders. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to remain that way. And so we've lectured at different colleges of Vassar, Hunter, I've been to Harvard, I've been to different colleges throughout the country and other places um, to really represent the issue. Um, right. and to change it. And so a lot of people are doing that work and, and colleagues like Lisa and others who are doing this amazing work, we really appreciate that. And so the Osborne Association gives us the opportunity to continue to do that work. Which is great and I'm glad that you talked about that in terms of, of, of people like Lisa sure. coming in because here you are from Kansas mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and what does that feel like to be yeah. in this completely different environment than Kansas. I mean, you've been in New York for a while, but still, it's... Yeah. yeah, and you know, I think, so I became a social worker. Mainly, I read the Code of Ethics and I said, this mm -hmm. is incredible. This mm -hmm. is about the worth and dignity of each mm -hmm. individual, and this is, this is all about social justice, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, and 
um, you know, those of us who have had some brush-ins with the justice system when we were younger, it, my experience was very different. Mm -hmm. And I imagine right. that my experience, mm -hmm. um, well, definitely is very different than yours. And mm -hmm. I think um, what I saw, especially when I was younger, is that as a white young person, um, with the oh, upbringing yeah. that I had, my experience was very different than my friends who were involved in the system. So I said, this is, this is what I have to do. Um, and I have to figure out a way to get a job doing this, and then I have to work myself out of a job. So mm -hmm. there is no system no needed right. um, specifically for young men and women of color mm -hmm. in this system. It's, it's insane. There's two Absolutely. different justice systems. Um, so doing that in Kansas, where there's still disproportionate minority representation in the system, or doing that in New York, it's still the same right. work. And mm -hmm. what's beautiful about New York is the the thinkers that are here and the policymakers that are here um, it's it's incredible and over the last decade here it's been really reform after reform and you know the system is getting smaller the system is getting much smaller for kids and and that's a beautiful thing so when I don't have to do this work anymore and I can <laughs> right you know go, can go do whatever I told all my staff that we'll help them find jobs because they're all very capable and we'll we'll not have jobs that's, anymore that's mm -hmm. great and that's I think I we have only about a minute left unfortunately but I think that you've both in some ways answered one of the questions that I had which is how do you keep yourself I mean, it's, it has to be, you have stories of successes, mm -hmm. but I'm sure there are heartbreaking stories sure. that are not stories of successes. And you've talked a little bit about what drives you. Mm -hmm. um, is that what, is that drive what keeps you going on those days where you just No, think? absolutely, Eileen. I mean, it certainly motivates me to wake up every day knowing that in some way we're transforming people's lives um, through this kind of consistent way of caring for people is important for us. And to know that our younger people who have come through our programs have been hired by us and have been staffed and our staff yeah. um, have gone on to college to earn mm -hmm. degrees that are in unions, work in construction, um, that are working in daycare, working in, in retail, working in construction, uh, working in maintenance, right? To see those stories is really what makes my work refreshing, great. right? Mm -hmm. And inspires me more to do that work and the Osborne Association um, continues to stand on that you know belief that we care for the people that we work with because people need to know that they care right. or mm -hmm. care for right. and when they know they're cared for it kind of moves them in a way um, to make them feel whole and heal and so that's a large part of our work um, and in workforce we do that right we operate from the perspective of obviously caring for people but also with, with accountability with mm -hmm. that's a part of it because we don't want people to blame everybody the system mm -hmm. and we know right. the reality mm -hmm. of the system we know the reality of those who may be part of the system that perpetuates um, some of the policies that negatively impacts the lives of people of color but we want people to be culpable for their own decision making mm -hmm. and we encourage that and we hold people accountable mm -hmm. to that from a place of care yeah. that's great so Unfortunately, that's all we have time for, but I want to thank you for joining us as, and being guests on this show, and also um, thank the people who are watching this show. And if you, for our viewers, if you missed any part of today's episode or you would like to check out past episodes of Mission Bronx, go to www.bronxnet.tv under Bronxnet Specials and see you next time for another edition of Mission Bronx. I'm